I just hope that the rest of the world will keep on recognizing that what Hong Kong represents um, is really important and fundamental to all of us. As China marks 25 years since the handover of Hong Kong, Britain's last governor there, Chris Patton, tells me why he thinks the West let Hong Kong down. I'm Christiana Manpour in London. And when Britain handed Hong Kong back to China 25 years ago, ending more than 150 years of colonial rule, the city was set to be governed under the one country, two systems model, allowing it to retain democracy and freedom of speech, unlike in mainland China. But it wasn't long before Beijing started chipping away at that promise. In a moment, my interview with Britain's last governor of Hong Kong, but first, correspondent Christy Lou Stout looks at what's left of the territory's autonomy. The Sino-British relations. After Margaret Thatcher reached a deal with the Chinese on the return of Hong Kong, a local reporter took the Iron Lady to task. You signed an agreement with China promising to deliver over five million people into the hands of a communist dictatorship. Thatcher claimed mostly everyone in Hong Kong was happy with the deal and told Emily Lau. You may be a solitary exception. So what do you make of that answer today in 2022? Many of the journalists who subsequently stood up, they asked similar questions. So even in that room, I wasn't a solitary exception. July 1, 2022 marks exactly halfway through 50 years of the one country, two systems autonomy Beijing promised to Hong Kong at the 1997 handover. It aims to preserve the city's freedoms of expression and assembly, as well as its institutions, including an independent judiciary. But in the wake of the 2019 protests, pressure on the city's freedoms intensified thanks to a new national security law. Supporters say the law ended the chaos of 2019 and restored order, but it did more than that. Scenes of mass protests like this are no more. At least 186 people have been arrested under the law, including a 90-year-old Catholic cardinal. The opposition is virtually wiped out with many of the city's pro-democracy figures in jail or exile. Politically charged artworks like the Pillar of Shame Tiananmen Memorial have been removed. Dozens of civil society groups, including the city's largest independent trade union, have disbanded. And national security investigations have led to the shuttering of news outlets like the Apple Daily. When asked about charges of diminished freedoms, a Hong Kong government spokesman told CNN, many freedoms and rights are not absolute and can be restricted for reasons including protection of national security and public safety. So as former security chief John Lee prepares to lead the city from July 1, what is left of Hong Kong's promised autonomy? We have autonomy in religion, in education, in media, including social media, in the internet, in how we manage our civil service. The second system is still here. It is functioning. It's under stress. We want one Hong Kong to be free. Lao has always been a skeptic of one country, two systems, as a reporter, a lawmaker, and former chair of the Democratic Party. I will not say that one country, two system is completely finished. The fact that I can stand here in the Democratic Party office to talk to you shows there's some freedom. And, uh, and there are some differences, but they are getting less and less. Lao says she is staying in the city to support her friends and colleagues in prison, abiding by her mantra, be bold, be wise, and be careful. Emily Lao speaking to Christy Liu Stout there. President Xi Jinping ventured outside mainland China for the first time since the start of the pandemic to visit Hong Kong on this 25th anniversary, burnishing his own view of success there. Over the past few years, Hong Kong has withstood one severe test after another and overcome one risk and challenge after another. After weathering the storms, Hong Kong has emerged from the ashes with vigorous vitality. Critics say Hong Kong has become virtually a police state, and we should note that journalists from several international media organizations like Reuters and CNN were blocked from covering Xi's trip. As the last governor in Hong Kong, Chris Patton said that Britain had provided, quote, the scaffolding that enabled the people there to ascend. I have no doubt that with people here holding on to these values which they cherish, 
Hong Kong's star will continue to climb. Hong Kong's values are decent values. They are universal values. And he's written about his experience in a new book called The Hong Kong Diaries. I started by asking him about his feelings as he handed over the reins. Lord Chris Patton, welcome back to our programme. Nice to be with you again. So let me take you back 25 years. Today is the anniversary of the handover. You were governor of Hong Kong then. I just want to read something you sent back to London. I have relinquished the administration of this government, God save the Queen, Patton. Concise? What were your emotions then? Well, they were a lot less concise than that. Um, I was leaving a city I loved. I was leaving some really great friends. My family, ditto, because they'd, they'd loved it, and my wife, who was the real hero of, the, of, of my time there, had loved it as well. Um, I felt uh, very emotional about um, whether Hong Kong would be able to um, survive as it had as a, as a great international um, financial city, a, an extraordinary combination of, of uh, economic freedom and political freedom. I hoped that that would all, all be true. And on the whole, the Chinese leadership at the time seemed to be slowly relaxing the communist grip on every aspect of life in China. So I, I guess we all hoped that that would be true for Hong Kong as well. So let me ask you, with the fullness of time and the way you've just sort of, you know, contextualised your hopes at the time, was it more of a hope than a kind of a certainty? I mean, I don't want to say Pollyannish, but do you think Britain just put too much hope in the idea that communist China would honour for 50 years, which they said they would, the one country, two systems? Yeah, well, the... the... The, um, my, my biggest critic in, in, in Hong Kong um, on the British side was a retired diplomat um, who was a great expert on China, um, but a rather vain and, and vain guy who didn't accept that anybody else had a point of view which was worth considering. And he actually tended to think of Hong Kong rather than Hong Kongers. And his, the kernel of his arguments about Hong Kong was looking at the Chinese leadership. He would say... They may be thuggish dictators, but they're men of their word. Well, we now know that part of that is true. And for some time, they reasonably clearly kept to the, to the main points of the international treaty we'd signed with them and kept to the agreements uh, about uh, Hong Kong having a high degree of autonomy and, and hanging on to its way of life. I think that changed fundamentally, and we weren't to know it would happen like this, with Xi Jinping an old-fashioned Maoist uh, uh, who, who believes in, in uh, the cult of personality, in controlling everything himself, is even pushing the economy um, in the sort of Mao direction, uh, state-owned enterprises uh, being the most important, private sector squeezed. And I think what's happening in with dealing with COVID at the moment there um, is a bit uh, sort of Maoist. So I think that we weren't to know that Xi Jinping would take over and... Xi Jinping, his first instructions to the party and government cadres were to fight what he called an intense struggle about, and then he listed all the things that you and I would regard as being fundamentals of a free society, um, pro proper historical inquiry, freedom of speech, um, ru rule of law, separation of powers. And what he was actually describing there, it's quite th interesting when you look at it, was a pretty good uh, uh, way of talking about Hong Kong. And I think why one of the reasons why he's been so ruthlessly tough on Hong Kong is that Hong Kong represents a, a political and intellectual challenge to the notion that um, uh, Chinese communist central control uh, will rule forever and, and uh, be a very attractive thing for the rest of the world, which is, of course, nuts. You, you talk about in your book a speech you made about this whole issue in 2017. Of course, that was after Xi, as we know. And you said the most difficult question after this speech was from a kid who said, we've listened to you, Mr. Patton, but what if you're wrong? What will happen if the Communist Party starts arresting us, sending people to prison? Um, you know, you obviously went through all the Nelson Mandela, all the hope and dreams of democracy and how it's inevitable yeah. and this and that. But that, that child or rather that, that young person asked you a very relevant question. Sure. Um, and... Uh... I, nowadays, I find the most difficult thing I'm asked again and again by 
people from Hong Kong who are in Britain, by students. There are lots at the university where I'm the chancellor at Oxford. Uh, and they say to me, should we go back to Hong Kong? And it's a most extraordinarily difficult question. I mean, there are 100,000 of them in the UK now making a huge contribution to the country. But, but able people, doctors, nurses, teachers, um, uh, and entrepreneurs. And what do I say to them? I, I can express, as you've said, all those wonderful remarks of, of people like Nelson Mandela that you can't, you can't lock up an idea. And I do believe that in the long run, um, uh, the ideas that we represent in, in uh, democracies, in open societies, will triumph over uh, surveillance state totalitarianism, like you see in, 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 in China. And I think we're also, to a considerable extent, dealing with post-peak China, just as we're dealing with, with post-peak Putin. Um, but what, but it's, it's very difficult to give those assurances with complete conviction and to be seen to be mm -hmm. suggesting that other people should have to be braver than I've ever been. So I find it, it, it morally really, really difficult. Um, and I just hope that the West of the world will keep on recognising that what Hong Kong represents um, is really important and fundamental to all of us. Tell me how you describe Hong Kong right now. All these brave people have found themselves in jail. How do you describe it and how do you see it in the next five, even ten years? Well, a great international financial city, um, uh, a, a free city, albeit not an entirely democratic one, but on the way to democracy, uh, is being turned into, a, um, frankly, a neo-police state. Uh, now um, run by a policeman who who uh, who earned his colours, earned his house captain's colours um, for the Chinese by being the policeman who was responsible for the appalling policing of the uh, of the demonstrations against the extradition treaty in 2019, when there were up to two million people uh, on the streets, and rather than talk to people, they were dealt with with tear gas and plastic baton rounds uh, and tasers. Indeed, I was suggesting the other day that maybe the emblem of, of this Hong Kong, at least for the time being, should be the taser rather than the bauhinia, the, the flower. So it, it's, it's really grim. And of course, of course, what happens is each of these leaders, while um, they go along with whatever their masters in Beijing want, they all pretty well make, they all, I think, I think everyone since I was in, since I was in Hong Kong myself, each one of them has either themselves or their family had foreign passports. In the case of Mr. Lee, um, his wife and, uh, and two sons have foreign passports. Carrie Lam's husband and two sons had had British passports. So you ask yourself, if they're so confident about the future, why make sure their families have got, have got foreign passports? I mean, I'm, 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 I'm very happy that they should want to live in, in Britain, but there's a sort of awful paradox about the fact that these people who are locking up kids um, are, who can't come here, although I'm trying to change that, we're trying to change that, and with some success at the moment, uh, they're locking up kids mm -hmm. while themselves have kids who can come here with a passport. It's, 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 real, it's worse than ironic. You know, you have said, and you say in your book, you basically assess greed to be the West's motivating factors to relations with China and, indeed, Russia in terms of natural resources. We're seeing it all play out now. But you also said post-peak Putin and post-peak Xi. But it doesn't look like that from here. It looks like they are at the peak of their, uh, of their, their own ideas for the world, which are autocratic, which don't go around you know, the rule of law, and which, as we can see in Russia's case anyway, doesn't even respect international law or boundaries. How should the West deal with these countries if we're not going to divide the world into a new Cold War? Even though um, China has been an accomplice um, to uh, Russia's uh, wicked behaviour uh, in uh, Ukraine, um, they are in slightly different categories. Um, Russia is very much a nation in decline, which is trying to uh, reimagine um, its past again um, and trying to uh, trade in grievance-soaked nationalism. Um, and uh, it, no, no, if, you, if you ever ask yourself, what do you have in the house apart from um, a vodka and a, uh, and, a, and a copy of War and Peace that was actually made in, in Russia? Nobody has anything. We're dependent, excessively dependent on Russian oil and gas 
But, but Russia is not a coming country. Russia is, has nuclear weapons, not a very good army, though a large one, and is being trounced uh, whenever there's a, free, a fair fight in Ukraine. China's different. China is a much bigger and more important part of the global economy. And I've never thought that we should try to contain China, but I do think we should constrain China when it behaves badly. And we shouldn't be terrorized. What we should do, what we should do is to stand up for our own values. Um, democracy, open societies um, are going to last much longer than totalitarian regimes, provided we stand up for ourselves, work together, work together when we're being bu bullied. And unfortunately, there are some signs that we're not always prepared to stand up for de democratic values. I look at what's happening in the United States. I look at what's happening in parts of Europe now, and I worry. I look at what's happening in the, Repu in the Republican Party in the United States and worry when I see people denying that President Biden won the election. I mean, it is not a very good signal to, s to send about the long-term strength of democracy. You led me right into my next question, because what about democracy in your own country? You were obviously a Tory MP for a number of years. You were chairman of the Conservative Party. But you've recently said about the current government here, we have a nationalist, populist government that is fatally not popular. You have called about called it the Johnson cult still hanging on and describing this government as shameful and seedy. So we know your view here. Tell us a little bit more about it and what can your party do? Well, what, it, what is quite interesting um, is that the, the sort of views I've expressed have in similar terms, not maybe with, with, with quite these sort of technicolor adjectives, but they've been expressed by for example, two former leaders of the Conservative Party, Michael Howard and, and William Hague, um, uh, many others. So all of them expressing a lack of self, of, a lack of confidence in the Prime Minister. Whether it will persuade him to do the decent thing, I, I don't know. Um, a friend of mine who was one of his teachers at school wrote a report about him when he was 16 or 17, which, is, which has been true right through his life. It, he, he, he said of, of Boris in a, in a note to his father, it, Boris thinks that it's churlish of the rest of us to, to not to rec recognize that he's exceptional uh, and that the network of obligations and duties which the rest of us have to have to uh, have to recognize don't apply to him uh, and that's unfortunately um, been the sort of way he's, he's, he's lived for the last whatever it is 50 odd years and what do you think are the most um at risk elements of rule of law, human rights, a democratic nation. We know that in terms of Brexit and protocol, this prime minister intends to rip up a deal that he solemnly agreed to with the EU. We know that in terms of uh, refugees and asylum seekers, they're sending them to Rwanda, which has at the very best a questionable human rights record. What, what worries you about what may be coming down the pike? Well, I tell you what worries me most, perhaps. I mean, I'm worried about all those things. The, um, it, it's very difficult to stand up internationally for the rule of law and for sticking to your word if you don't seem to be doing it to yourself. Um, but what really worries me is that we're going to face, I think, in the United Kingdom in the next few years, a real, another real challenge to the United Kingdom from Scotland uh, and maybe from, from nor in Northern Ireland as well. And I think we need a government which is capable of working with others in other parties in order to put the best possible case for the union, um, because without it, without it, we'd be a much depleted country, both in international terms and in economic terms. And, and finally, you alluded to, you know, the strains on our political discourse and political activity, the deep divisions, the partisan nation. You said, you know, I, I worry for the American Republican Party, but also, as we've just described, the British Conservative Party's got its own issues. Uh, you are probably the last or one of the few of a dying breed of a moderate conservative who has, you know, much more ability to cross lines and get business done. You said recently that you're angry, and it's probably just because so many of the things that I think my generation took for granted are now being trashed. Like what? Well, let me just say I went into politics partly because I got involved in an American campaign when I'd just been a student in New York working for John Lindsay, who became the mayor of New York and was originally a Republican, became an independent, became a Democrat. But when I was working in New York in a political campaign, the, the political representation of New York was Javits, Keating, Rockefeller. None of them, none of them would get a, stand a prayer in a Republican primary these days. 
they were internationally minded. Um, they were believed in markets, but they also believed in social responsibility. And they won't, weren't driven by a right wing ideology, which has no relevance um, to the lives most people li live, which is based on trying to open up wedges between people on racial or cultural lines. Uh, and I really worry that if we allow ourselves to be bet to be torn apart by that sort of identity politics, it is going to seriously undermine our ability to work together uh, in defending the values which have made us all the best places to live uh, in the world. Boy, at a time when we can really see them under attack. Lord Patton, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much indeed. Nice to be with you again. A sobering assessment from a veteran politician.